So I actually appreciated Jeff's question because he's alerted all of us to the complexities and you're all too aware of those complexities. We're going to hear um, right now from a library system that has far less complexity in terms of rates of poverty, age of equipment, probably another, a number of other variables I wouldn't even be able to mention. Nonetheless, it's going to give us a little bit of a window into when this connectivity begins to be a reality for a library system. What are the steps that are taken? What are the obstacles that are encountered? What does the work plan look like for folks? How is that work plan accommodated on an already over a full plate? What are the benefits that begin to accrue? And the person who's going to lead us in this investigation is a woman named Linda Crow, who I'm sure the folks in the library community know very well. I just came to know her a year ago. Before I went to meet with Linda, Lewis Fox said to me, she's a force of nature. And in, in fact, <laughs> it was true. <laughs> Tremendous energy, enthusiasm, passion, commitment, practicality, a keen sense of irony, all the kinds of qualities I love, right? And the word, I, I, I like a word even more um, to match with Linda. And it's a word um, that I love anyway. I never get to say, so I'm going to say it right now. Indefatigable. How's that? Tireless. <laughs> Indefatigable. <laughs> um, I really, I mean, it, it's just simply true. So um, I'm going to read you a little bit about the number of organizations that she runs. So she is the executive director of the Peninsula Library System, and that's what she's here to present on today. But that is part of the Pacific Library Partnership, which is a larger entity that she also guides. She's also executive director of Khalifa, which is a statewide library consortia that provides services and programs to libraries in California. And that was another real learning point for me around California libraries. Probably, maybe it's libraries everywhere. They have got this consortial approach to operation down. And it's very inspiring to see because it results, when it's done well, in tremendous efficiencies. So the way Linda, as I understand it, has organized this session is she has put together a set of questions that have kind of plagued her and plagued her colleagues in entering into this process over the last year. She's brought along with her three colleagues. Linda's going to pose a question. And the colleagues that she's brought will try to address that question. As she's doing so, she's going to ask you to try to write down a question of your own. Because fundamentally, she wants this to be an interactive session, really a conversation. And a conversation, actually, that Jeff provided the perfect lead into, which is, what the heck is this going to require and by when? Right? So I'm going to introduce Linda. She's going to introduce her colleagues. It's going to be a little awkward because of the way this room is set up. We can't sit at the table. It hasn't been mic'd. So everybody's going to kind of have to cluster around the podium. But we'll, we'll make it work as they do in libraries, right? OK, Linda. They're all going up. So uh, imagine that you're in my living room, and I'm sitting around asking these guys questions. And this isn't exactly how I had pictured this. Um, I thought I was going to be the interviewer like Terry Gross. Um, and so I wrote these uh, 10 questions down. Um, I want to introduce my colleagues. This is Anne-Marie Despain. She's the director of the San Mateo County Library. She has 12 branches and is a member of the Peninsula Library System. And in fact, I think about 36% of uh, the system is in the county library system. This is Monica Schultz, who's the director of IT for the Peninsula Library System, and John Sarmiento, who's a network engineer. 
Now, um, John has stepped in just because he happened to drive us here today. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were bringing Frank Vaskelis, who's the chief, uh, uh, chief operating technology person, I don't know what his title is, of the San Mateo Community College District, because they are members of the Peninsula Library System. And I had him scheduled to do a lot of talking, and I wouldn't have to, right? Right. Well, I've got his presentation, so I'm going to do more talking than I had planned to be. Um, and most, and none of these questions were scheduled for me. So you know, when I'm talking, I'm Frank. And John, I assigned some of Frank's questions. So we're, this has happened exactly like I pictured it. So um, let's start out with the history of the Peninsula Library System and the San Mateo Community Colleges. And whoever asked the question about working with the offices of education, this is an example of working with another scenic member. We work with Community College District. So in May of 1988, the Community College District joined the Peninsula Library System, PLS we call it, and it's a joint powers agency that includes all the public and now community college libraries in the county. Um, we have eight library, public library jurisdictions, one is a county library and the rest are city libraries. The, county, the community colleges are San Mateo uh, Community College, Kenyatta College, and Skyline College. And I asked Frank to say, what was the objective of the community college joining PLS? And it was to find a way to automate their libraries and eliminate the card catalog to expand library resources available to students and faculty and to benefit from the other cooperative services and to replace its former uh, and to um, bulk up their buying capacity. So that's why they wanted to be a member. What was the role of the community colleges was my next question to Frank. And he said, in the spring of 1994, PLS was getting an ILS, an integrated library system. Our former system was just a circulation system. And it was determined that we needed a new location for it. And we decided that the community colleges would be the place to locate the whole system. And um, PLS and the San Mateo Community College District developed an agreement whereby the college district would host these servers in, ex in, in their existing computer center. And they were going to provide us with office space, even though it was a trailer outside of the building, provide network and technical support to maintain and network and re to maintain the network and related services. These are his notes. Provide a generator for emergency power backup, manage the PLS technical team that was located in the college district, and to share San Mateo Community College's internet connectivity with the libraries. That was the biggie. We didn't know a lot about connectivity. We needed some help, and Frank knew about this. I mean, he knew about frame relay. Frame relay's old, Jeff. <laughs> really old. I know, I know. <laughs> and beyond. <laughs> um, so what was the role of the PLS staff monitor? Um, so, uh, Way back when we were on frame relays, uh, some of our sites had from one to three T1s. Um, in 07, we began conversations about moving to fiber. Uh, so we started um, talking with council, and council approved the project, and we uh, moved into Optiman. Uh, most of our libraries had from five to 10 megs uh, per site. And even those libraries that um, had 10 megs went up to 20 megs, and we were still bottlenecking around 3 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon when all the children got out of school. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so, uh, so we had to start looking at other alternatives. Uh, our circuits are, um, like Jared said, we're, they're shared among staff, Wi-Fi, and wired computers. Um, so when our network was bottlenecking, um, it was affecting also staff. Um, so we had to look at other alternatives. Yes. And Frank wasn't happy. I'm so glad he's not here. He, you know, we were taking up their bandwidth. I mean, lots of their bandwidth, like 60% of it. Um, so anyhow, what pushed the PLS administration and community colleges to consider the changes in a resource allocation? PLS had been sharing the college district's one, one gig scenic connection to the internet, sort of 
Yes. Anyway, PLS usage of that internet pipe had grown over the past few years to the point where PLS was using more than 60% of the available bandwidth. The number of PCs installed in 32 branches had grown to more than 1,600. In a typical day, 2,000 different users were using the wireless network. Um, some specific examples were the San Mateo Public Library, that's a city library, not the county library, opened a new library in 2006 with three megabits. But the congestion problems were horrible by three months, by three months in operation. The library subsequently um, upgraded to 10 megabits and they were saturated within six months. In the next year, they went up to 20 megabits and it was already at saturation. And I want to say that they are one of the libraries are, that have migrated now to one gigabyte. And the first day they migrated, they went from 20 to 40 use. Um, it's amazing. You know, just put it in and they'll come. Burlingame Library recently went from 10 to 20. And yet this double capacity was not sufficient by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Students entering the, the library in the afternoon frequently play games, watch videos, and stream other content. And the system would pause because of the usage. Um, during high use periods in South San Francisco Public Library, and I think that's the last one of our first 12 that are getting one gigs first, um, are having problems because the network stops entirely. Um, for example, on tax day, volunteer tax preparers could not transmit taxes as part of the tax preparation program that the library was offering because they just couldn't, they didn't have the bandwidth. Recognizing the continuous growth demand for bandwidth within each library and the very poor performance many libraries were experiencing, it was determined that a more strategic solution was required. Working with scenic team, a new network design was developed, which when implemented, and it uh, will be implemented for all 32 branches, by the end of June, um, each branch will have one gigabyte connection. So let me go on. Who has the next question? <laughs> um, what were the options that we considered? What were some of the options we considered besides scenic? So um, in PLS, all the branches are connected, and they all lead to, I'm oh, sorry, in, um, they all lead to the head end of the college, and it was one gig pipeline. Um, some of the considerations, uh, some of the options that we considered were to increase the bandwidth at each site. However, that would not alleviate the one gig connection, or it would also increase the amount of bandwidth we were taking from the college already, which, as Linda said, was from 50 to 60 percent of their bandwidth. Uh, another option was to start blocking um, certain data, and that's not something that is acceptable in, in libraries. So we, can, we can't block anything. So our third option um, is, was when Linda and uh, Lewis met. <laughs> <laughs> that was the third option. That's like uh, serendipitous. Yeah. That's, that's how we operate. Um, anyways, uh, also another option was, well, you know, a lot of our libraries um, are used by the community around the library because the wireless gets out there. We talked about not letting that happen. That's not what we wanted to happen. We wanted our wireless to be available to our communities. Um, so where were we? We had to go and find something to do. And the process was implemented by approaching Scenic and beginning discussions on what might be possible to address the rapidly growing network and bandwidth needs of the libraries. Scenic made a proposal for a new design which was accepted by PLS. The college district will continue to physically host PLS's servers in its computer center and, the call it, and install a one gig connection to each library location and a cutoff to the new 10 gig scenic circuit at the head end. Move PLS servers to their own DMZ. When I saw DMZ and Frank wrote that, I thought, demilitarized zone? John says that's right. <laughs> Using PLS assigned IP addresses. So now are some of the other questions. Um, when it's completed, when will it be completed? First of all, I'm going to ask John, and what's left to go? And then I'm going to ask Anne Marie some questions about use. So we started this process um, sometime last year, around the summertime. 
And at this point, out of our 32 libraries, we have about, we have 10 sites cut over to one gig. And the remaining 22, we're planning to have them cut over by the end of June this year. Okay, thanks, John. Thank you for coming. <laughs> um, and it will be completed, as John said, by the end of the year. What are the benefits to PLS? And I'm going to ask that to Amory as a library director, and also to Monica, who has to administer this. So, um, so uh, as Linda indicated, I'm Anne Marie Despain, and I'm the director of the San Mateo County Library System. And I just want to um, echo some of the issues that we were having. So we have 12 community libraries. Um, some of them are very large and serve large communities, and some are very small. And we do have some rural areas in the county as well. So we serve um, probably some of the most advantaged economically um, communi communities and, and also some of the poorest communities um, in the county. And so it was really twofold. We were having many patron complaints, and that's when I became aware of the issue because, of course, a lot of those complaints um, make their way up to the director. And so we were really not offering good service, and that's one thing that public libraries um, really um, pride themselves in is the, the excellent customer service we can provide. So that was happening. And then we also, um, our libraries are changing dramatically. And so um, we were encouraging staff to come up with new programs, new ideas. And they were, and we were limited in um, actually implementing those. So some of the programs um, that I just, I wanted to mention, that staff came up with were, and we're, we're implementing those now. I'm happy to say that six of our 12 libraries are now, have now moved to um, the Scenic Connection. But we recently um, incorporated a teen music studio in one of our libraries, and um, teens are creating music. Um, we have a science and technology lab at several, several of our libraries. Um, this past month, um, there's a program that we funded um, for teens to create um, digital movies, take courses in filmmaking, and then they're creating digital music. We can actually host those now. Um, game development classes um, for uh, the public. Wireless printing has been implemented now. Um, that's something that we were asked about. I mean, we thought we were really smart because we were running out of room for computers in our small libraries. So we started implementing um, laptop checkouts, and that just increased the demand more and more. Um, so <laughs> that kind of ended us, ended up coming around and biting us. But and then the other. Um, uh, the libraries are changing in their facilities and also the way we're staffing. We're uh, moving to different service models. We're not waiting at desks. And in order to rove or to have handheld devices, we actually need that flexibility in the broadband to get out from behind the desk. Um, so that's, those are other things that we're implementing or look forward to implementing. We're also, um, we talked a lot about, Jared talked about digital collections. Um, our communities are demanding more digital collections. And so um, the consortium is working to increase our ebook purchases, um, our e audio purchases. We recently launched e magazines, um, digital magazines, which are proving to be very popular. And we're also um, providing downloadable music right now and looking at down downloadable movies as well. Um, so I would say overall the benefits to the community, obviously just the access that we can provide to more people and then increase that time that we're able to offer. Um, it also leads to greater citizen involvement. A lot of our um, jurisdictions are looking at transparency, over open government, um, so it increases that. And then we, um, we are a system that uses RFID, and we rely heavily on that um, technology and also self-service technology. So um, pushing those kinds of, to keep up with the, the demand um, for libraries, we're um, harnessing you know, the customers doing for themselves. So it's essential that we have um, the broadband to support all of those activities. So those are just some of the examples um, of how it's benefiting our public libraries. 
And I want to say that Anne Marie um, and her staff have been um, great um, leading the other libraries because they'll be kicking us to do, you got to do something about this. We got to get this done. And so um, because of their kind of stirring this pot, that also helped to get us going. So we appreciate that. Okay, so what about the benefits to you, Monica? I know it's more work, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually. Um, so the benefits to PLS is um, most important, we get our own infrastructure. So we don't have the limitation of having to ask for permission at the colleges or implementing configurations that we were not allowed to implement before because we have to abide by the college's rules. So now we have the flexibility of implementing the configurations as well as increasing bandwidth as we please or as needed. Uh, we also have uh, purchased our own firewall and our own VPN as well as our own packet shaper so we have full control of our infrastructure and we are able to deploy projects that were uh, put on hold before because we didn't have the flexibility such as DHCP or, or simple projects as um, intrusion detection that we were not able to um, implement before. We are, we are looking forward to implementing them now. Um, another benefit um, which is huge not necessarily for my group for, for the administration is E-rate. Uh, Scenic is going to be taking over the process of um, report, uh, submitting E-rate, and that is, if you know, it's a very, very cumbersome process. Um, I know I was, um, gave uh, admins gray hair. <laughs> so uh, Scenic is taking that over as okay. well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so John already answered how many libraries are connected now. What's the difference? Do you see, I know you go out to libraries and you observe what's going on. What, do you notice any differences? Um, yeah, we don't get as much complaints now from the patrons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think we're ready if any of you have questions for us, because we'd really like to take some time and answer your questions and have you talk to us. No? <laughs> okay, you want to talk about the price? Okay, Monica wants to. Oh, Don, go ahead. Alan Means, uh, the Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, it's a, a Wi Fi question. You mentioned you had 2,000 sessions, I think, uh, one day. Uh, what's the general breakdown on? Best via wireless versus the fixed workstation uh, wireline, and uh, how many are walk-in versus the checkout devices? And uh, <laughs> what impact would you know, gig yeah. connectivity have on your interior planning for the wireless? I believe a lot of people come in to use the wired terminals, but there's only a limited number of stations that people can use. So a lot of people do bring in their own devices. Um, and nowadays, um, a person could have up to three devices to themselves, a laptop, a tablet, and a smartphone. So the added broadband uh, really helps our libraries you know, accommodate the needs of our patrons bringing in their own devices. Um, another difference is because our wire terminals are um, managed by time management systems, um, we give them two hours a day. But if a patron were to bring in his own laptop, they can spend the whole day there in the library. So a lot of people come in and you know, find a nice couch, somewhere nice to sit in the library and just hang out all day and you know, do what they need to do. Especially if they have a uh, some place to eat in the library. We did the network over the wireless network. You re yeah. Yeah, and um, a part of this project is we also upgraded our access points. Um, prior to this project, we were running uh, 802.11g access points. Um, we had to upgrade them to N right now. We didn't want to take the leap to 802.11ac um, just because cost mostly, but you know, we want to get there maybe in the next three to five years. Um, a lot of patrons use up a lot more um, bandwidth on the wireless just because they're you know they're not limited to time restraints mostly. Um, another thing we were able to implement was a, a wireless splash page that we didn't have before, where users needed to click accept on our policy in order to to proceed. 
and that helped us with liability issues if something were to happen you know, in terms of you know, data breaches or anything, uh, any kind of malicious activity. Okay, Monica. Um, also, with the, with the wireless um, splash page, the reason that we implemented the wireless splash page was because, like you said, Don, people are walking in with so many devices and they all automatically connect, and they were just sucking up all the bandwidth. Now that they have to accept the policy, people will um, use the bandwidth only for those devices that, that are required at that time. So if you're walking with your phone and you're not using the bandwidth, uh, you, you don't accept the policy, you, it's not sucking up the bandwidth as well. So uh, splash page were were uh, very beneficial. And we went with a company called Aerohive, and they're working very closely with libraries nowadays. So they can authenticate um, if you choose to. Any more questions? OK. We have to go to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> How are you guys in, uh, looking at addressing oh, the Children Internet Protection Act? Or filtering at the, at the libraries? Any thoughts of how? Well, <clears throat> um, we have e rate on our connectivity. We don't, it's a local issue if they decide that they are going to filter in the library itself. That's not part of our e rate get, and we don't, we have nothing to do with that as a system. So you use it only for transport or telecommunications, so that doesn't affect your. your Correct. Staff. And in I don't. General, so in general, the feeling is there's no no filtering mechanisms. It, the one varies. Yeah. Um, it varies. It actually varies by jurisdiction. Some um, city libraries filter, and some don't. We d at San Mateo County, we don't filter. Thank you. Do we have any libraries filtering? Uh, yeah, but if the, the libraries that are filtering, they are filtering on the local PCs themselves. So on the overall network, we, PLS does not filter. So the wireless, whoever would bring their that's correct. Any other questions? Okay. So you got lots of extra time from us. <laughs> you know, when, yeah, okay. one thing I did want to bring up is um, when we were uh, working directly with oh, AT&T, uh, for a 20 meg line, we were paying over $1,400 a month. Uh, with Scenic, for a 1 gig line, we are paying under $800 a month. Which is extremely. So this goes to the same question. My question earlier was: Do you connect that through the county office of education? Is that a point of presence for you, or do you have, have a scenic pop someplace that you go through? What's the what's the connectivity business model? Do you write a check to scenic for your services? Yeah, we connect at the our head end is at uh, the community um, colleges uh, data so you center. Do the community college as a larger entity that can no, I... no we have our own pipeline as, as as we started because we are the pilot project when we um, started doing business with scenic we're still in the same physical room but we have our own pipeline now oh, okay so logically separate physically correct Thank you. anything else but that doesn't mean that I think I think Jared and Brian from scenic and I sat down one day and we were kind of playing with the libraries in the state and seeing what was their closest scenic uh, member that they might be working with. I don't know where that ever went, but, that's, but it's possible that there'll be clusters, I think. Okay, anything else? Well, we'll be glad to talk to you or during breaks or at lunch or a call or um, you know, we're glad to talk to you about what we've done because we're pretty happy with it and we're pretty glad we've done the whole thing. It, it's, it's made life a whole lot easier for our libraries.